Apologetics 101, we have been talking about this over the last five weeks, and tonight I am calling this an apologetics appendix, but it really isn't an appendix. It is, in reality, the resurrection is the most important element of our faith. So grab a Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm going to look at several verses and mention several verses to you. And you will see shortly why we are talking about the resurrection. Why I believe the resurrection, or why I believe in the resurrection. And again, this is an appendix to our previous lessons uh, on Apologetics 101, knowing why we believe, what we believe, and being able to share that with others. I think many times we don't think apologetics are necessary because we don't have conversations with unbelievers. We only interact with believers and with people that believe everything the same way we do. And so our beliefs are never challenged. Let me tell you something. As a student pastor for going on 16 years now, our young people have questions. They're being challenged. And when they ask mom, dad, grandma, grandpa those questions, how are you going to be able to respond to them? Would you be equipped to have a discussion with them. And I know many times the re we resort to, well, just believe what the Bible says. And I understand that. And I affirm that. And we shared at the beginning several weeks ago um, an apologetic for apologetics. So I don't want to go down that road again. I do encourage you to go back and review these Bible studies. I know I've given you a lot of information. And it will be helpful to go back over them. Uh, so I don't forget, I am in the process of editing and uploading uh, just the teaching portion of the Apologetics 101 series to our church YouTube channel. So you'll be able to go and just watch that, slow it down, and we'll put links in the descriptions on those videos to help you out. Uh, because this is something you have to grow in. It's something, it's something you have to build into your life, and I want to encourage you to do that. So, why believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Well, the resurrection is very important. That seems like a no-brainer. But just in case uh, you were unaware, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number, I'll just start reading verse number 1. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain... For I delivered you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, the new the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. And then verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. So, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, our faith is in vain, and what I'm doing now, all our preaching, all our talk about God is in vain. And so, we need to ground our belief Beyond what I call hymns and hopes. Okay, hymns are great. Hope is great. Hope is a fruit of the Spirit. But what am I talking about when I say this? Consider the hymn, He Lives. All right? There's a line in that hymn that says, You ask me how I know He lives, and then it answers the question. He lives within my heart. But what if someone said to you, You ask me how I know He doesn't live. He doesn't live within my heart. Then you're stuck with two people. One person says he lives in my heart. Another person says he doesn't live in my heart. And there you go. And you go about your business. There's a problem with this answer, I think. First, it makes the resurrection's reality into some subjective experience. So 
whether someone has an experience of the resurrection or not has nothing to do with whether the resurrection happened. And I hope you understand what I'm getting at here in a few moments. The resurrection is an event that happened at a particular place and at a particular time. Whether one has an experience of that event or not. So you could think of various illustrations of history. Think of someone on a far off jungle or island in a remote location who has never heard of George Washington. They do not know George Washington exists. Does their lack of knowledge of the existence of George Washington affirm whether he was the president, the first president of the United States, or not? No. Whether someone knows who he is or has experienced who he is or anything has no bearing on the fact that George Washington was the first president of the United States. And I am arguing, I am trying to persuade, I am trying to give you evidence that we should look at the resurrection and for our purposes tonight as equivalent to George Washington was the first president of the United States. We're talking about history. We're talking about events in history. Second, the resurrection, while it certainly Certainly, and I don't want to mislead anyone, it has spiritual implications, obviously. It has spiritual implications, but it is about a body that was dead and came back to life. There are many folks you'll talk to who have no problem with a spiritual resurrection. But that is not what Christianity teaches. Christianity teaches and affirms that a man, Jesus of Nazareth, had a physical body that was killed by Romans, was buried, and that physical body came back to life. That is what Christianity affirms and teaches. So we can sing songs with joy, but our witness and discipleship demands we go a little deeper. Go beyond, he lives within my heart. Now, as I've said before, through all of these studies on apologetics, you don't have to grasp everything I'm trying to share in order to be a follower of Jesus? Of, of course not. But in order to have a discussion or share your faith, sometimes you do need to be equipped to communicate with individuals. Right? The fact that you're saved by faith, plus nothing, minus nothing, in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for your sins and his death, burial, and resurrection... That is no excuse for us to remain immature in our understanding, okay? And that's really what I'm trying to encourage all of us to do. Now, we've read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8. And then there's other passages I want to look to, but I'm going to put these uh, verses in the description when I load this onto our YouTube channel as well. Matthew 27, verses 57 through 28, 15. Mark 15, 42 uh, through 16, 15. Luke 23, 50 through 24, 43, and John 19, 38 through 20, 31, all four Gospels have a lengthy narrative about the resurrection of Jesus. All four Gospels. They each give a unique spin, a unique look at it, but they all speak to the resurrection. Acts 1, 3, I mentioned this in our Apologetics for Apologetics, where Jesus presented himself alive by many infallible proofs. That word infallible proofs is a strong legal term. It was the strongest word that could be used in a court of law for presenting evidence. So the apostles, they saw Jesus killed by the Romans, and then they see him alive. And Jesus presents them with evidence. Think of Thomas. Jesus presents Thomas with evidence. Thomas, a week earlier, said, I will not believe unless I see with my eyes and touch with my hands. When Jesus shows up a week later, does Jesus scold Thomas? He said, Thomas, you should just know. He does say to Thomas, you're slow to believe, but then he presents him with evidence. He says, touch. It's me. And so there is a place for speaking about evidence. The New Testament doesn't know anything at all about a subjective feeling about the resurrection. I believe the resurrection is true because I just feel it. Okay. William Lane Craig, a Christian apologist, here's what he said. Without the belief in the resurrection, the Christian faith could not have come into being. The disciples would have remained crushed and defeated men. Even had they continued to remember Jesus as their beloved teacher, 
His crucifixion will have forever silenced any hopes of his being the Messiah. The cross would have remained the sad and shameful end of his career. The origin of Christianity, therefore, hinges on the belief of the early disciples that God had raised Jesus from the dead. So when we talk about the resurrection, we're really not talking about an appendix. We're talking about the hinge of it all. So what's the path to believe the resurrection? You'll see on this slide there are things we've been talking about. So here's the path that we're going to lay out. Step one, there is truth that is knowable. And we talked about that in our second lesson in this series, Apologetics 101, about truth. So there is truth that is knowable. It is true that God exists. We talked about that in lesson three. Therefore, miracles are possible. So if, it, if it's possible that God exists, and I believe there's evidence that God exists, then it's possible miracles happen. And if it's possible miracles happen, then the resurrection would be a big miracle. It's possible the resurrection happened. The Bible is a reliable record of actual events. We talked about that last week. The Bible records the resurrection as a historical event. So do you see the flow of what we've been doing in our study? Truth is knowable. It's true God exists. And since it's true that God exists, miracles are possible. The Bible is a reliable record of actual events, and the Bible records the resurrection as an actual event. Okay? Now, what we are not saying, you'll notice, I'm not saying, although I affirm it, and our church affirms it, that the Bible is the inspired, infallible, authoritative word of God. And in order to assess the resurrection, we're not claiming that. We're saying that the Bible is a reliable record of ancient history. So we can treat it and examine its claims in the same way we look at another history book. Now, uh, my older two children, Elijah and Abigail, they can't stand history. I love history, so I don't know what's wrong with them. Okay, I'm not, they're, they must take after their mother. Okay, but, all right, we want to examine these things just like we look at any other piece of history, and that's what we're doing. There's nothing that says, well, if it has a miracle, then it can't be considered historical. Why not? If there is a God, miracles are at least possible. Now, we have heard, and I've heard that miracles are actual, but we're not trying to go that far. I'm just saying, if there is a God, and I think there is solid reason to believe there is a God, miracles are possible, therefore, it is possible. So let's look at the historical data and see where it points. Okay. So there are three facts surrounding the resurrection. The, this is uh, the data, the historical data. Now these three facts are facts that Christians and non-Christians alike agree. So what are we talking about? What we're asking is, what is the best explanation for these facts? Okay? Again, when we talk about apologetics and things of this nature, we are not talking about lock, stock, and barrel, absolute 100% certainty. That's not how this works. But we're talking about reasonable conclusions. Where does the evidence point? What explanation makes the most sense? So let's talk about these three facts. Fact number one, the discovery of an empty tomb. Fact number two, the appearances of Jesus. And fact number three, the disciples' beliefs and preaching. The facts surrounding the resurrection need to be explained. No one denies these facts. Most all scholars and individuals on the street would acknowledge that something happened that changed the disciples dramatically. Everyone acknowledges something happened. We're just trying to say what's the best explanation for what happened. The disciples were changed dramatically. So the question is a matter of the best explanation. We are not, again, after foolproof certainty, but reasonable conclusions based on all the information. And that's what apologetics does. All right, and that's what we're aiming at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you four alternate explanations be beside the, uh, besides the traditional Christian explanation of these facts and then answer those alternate explanations. Okay? And I'll try and move through this quickly. I have a uh, hand up. It's going to be in the vestibule. And I'll put a link in the description when I load this to YouTube so you have all of this information I just, I just unloaded on you, okay? Here we go. Alternate explanations of the facts. 
Alternate explanation number one. The conspiracy or stolen body explanation. If you'll recall from the Gospel of Matthew, this was the explanation that the Jews concocted. Do you remember? The guards at the tomb, they came back and reported to the Jewish leadership what had happened. And the Jewish leadership said, don't worry, we'll, we'll got you, we've got your backs. We'll say the disciples came in the middle of the night and stole the body. So there was already, on e the first Easter Sunday morning, there was already an alternative explanation for the facts. And it was that the disciples stole the body. The conspiracy theory. They came and stole the body from the tomb. How do we answer this? Well, several lines of thinking help us answer this. Number one, Roman soldiers were guarded the tomb. Matthew 27, 62. Roman soldiers were elite fighting men. And they were guarding the tomb. The disciples were fishermen and tax collectors. They are not, let me repeat, they are not overwhelming a group of Roman soldiers who are armed, okay? Enough to incapacitate them so they can uh, achieve this conspiracy and steal the body. So Roman soldiers guarded the tomb. Closely related to that, the disciples were cowards. Where were the disciples? When Jesus was nailed to the cross, all the exception of John, they were hiding they were under no inclination to go and take on the Roman soldiers. They were scary cats, just like you and I would have been. Answer three, the disciples had no motivation or context. What do I mean? The disciples were all loyal Jewish men. And in first century Judaism, there was no understanding of a Messiah that would die and rise from the dead. First century Judaism only understood a general resurrection at the end. They, didn't, they had no conception of one single resurrection. So the disciples were not motivated. They didn't have any theological or cultural context that would enable them or even put in their mind a conspiracy to steal the body. Fourth, the disciples died for the resurrection. Many will die for a lie they believe to be true. No one will die for a lie they know is a lie. So all the disciples died martyrs' deaths, except for John, who died as an old man in exile. If they concocted this conspiracy to steal the body for whatever reason, they knew they stole the body. But yet all of these men suffered immeasurably for the belief that Jesus rose from the dead. Again, many will die for a lie they believe to be true, no one will die for a lie they know is a lie. So I don't believe this is a solid explanation for these facts. Number two, the swoon theory. Now this used to be very popular, and it's the theory that Jesus did not die on the cross, but he fainted. When he was placed in the tomb, he was revived and went to the disciples who, who thought he had risen. Okay? How do we explain this? Number one, well, the Romans were expert executioners. For example, if a Roman soldier was tasked with the job of executing a criminal, and that criminal survived the execution, guess what happened to that Roman soldier? He was executed. So this was not a job where you made mistakes. They were expert executioners. Second, Jesus was stabbed in the heart with a spear. The spear went through and blood and water came out. There's a sack around the heart that the water, and it was punctured. Jesus' heart was punctured. That's why blood and water came out. Jesus would have been in desperate need of medical attention. That's putting it mildly. Jesus was wrapped in a hundred pounds of burial cloths and spices. The stone in front of the tomb was several tons in weight. So here's the question. If this is the explanation that's offered that Jesus did, it wasn't a resurrection, what it was is Jesus didn't die on the cross. He just fainted, and the cool, refreshing air of the tomb revived him, and he came out and the disciples thought he was resurrected. Here's the question. How could a broken, battered, severely wounded Jesus give the disciples the impression 
He was a victorious conqueror of death. When Jesus showed up, he would have been a mess. The disciples would have not thought, oh, he's risen from the dead victoriously. They would have said, someone get a doctor. Look at all of this. I mean, when you consider this, the 100 pounds of burial cross, after he'd been nailed to the cross, prior to that, if you consider the pat nine tails, the scourging, which oftentimes killed the individual, most individuals died before they made it to the cross because the scourging was so severe. All this happened, he's wrapped in 100 pounds of burial cross, and then there's a several ton stone put in front of the two, which went down a ramp. So the stone is like this, and you pushed it up a ramp. So Jesus wounded, would have had it from the inside, push the two, several ton stone out, and push it and roll it up a hill. Oh yeah, and take out the Roman soldiers that were their guard. Alright? So I don't think this is a very uh, worthwhile explanation of our facts. Three, the displaced body, wrong tomb theory. This is very simple. It's, well, it wasn't a resurrection. What happened was the women went to the wrong tomb and were mistaken when they saw an empty tomb. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, the Gospels tell us the women followed to see where Jesus was buried. Jesus, well, let's watch. Here's the answer. I'm getting ahead of myself. The women watched to see where Jesus would be buried, Matthew 15, 47. Jesus' tomb was the only tomb guarded by Roman soldiers. This is a private burial ground, not a public cemetery. And then if this is the case, why didn't the religious leaders, who would have known where the tomb was at, go to the correct tomb when the disciples began to preach the resurrection 50 days later? So if the religious leaders and the government officials wanted to squash Christianity once and for all, how could they have done it easily if Jesus did not rise from the dead? They knew where the tomb was at. When Peter and John on the day of Pentecost are preaching, when Peter is standing before the Sanhedrin and saying, you killed him, you killed the son of man, you did it. What could they have done? Hold on a minute, Peter. Let's go on a field trip. They could have taken everyone to the cemetery, roll the stone back, and say, there's his body. But they didn't. And the fact they did it is something that has to be explained. And many times folks will say, well, the women just went to the wrong tomb. But I don't think that is an answer. That is an answer are three facts. And then finally, the spirit or hallucination theory. Jesus did not really rise physically, but the disciples wanted him to be alive and had an emotional experience in which they thought they saw him. And I would, I guess to say, most people who would deny a bodily resurrection, this would be the explanation they would offer. Because remember, everyone said, believes that something happened. I remember uh, watching a clip of the, uh, the show The View and they were talking about the resurrection. And one of the four ladies was affirming the traditional biblical view of a bodily resurrection. And the others didn't deny that. They just all said, no, it was a spiritual resurrection. Not a single one of those ladies denied something happened. But they, except for one, thought it was a spiritual resurrection. Okay? So this one is one that we really need to look at. So how do we answer this? Was it just an emotional experience? The disciples were grieving and they wanted it to happen? Here we go. Number one, the disciples did not expect Jesus to rise. That is obvious, and I've already alluded to that. There was no conception in the Jewish mind of the first century of a dying and rising Messiah. So they weren't preconditioned to want this to happen. In Matthew 16 and 17, when Jesus is teaching this to the disciples, the disciples don't get it. As a matter of fact, Peter says, it's never going to be, Lord, we're not going to let you die. And Jesus rebuked Peter. Second, Jesus had a physical body. So when we read the down of the New Testament, that resurrection, Jesus had a physical body. They grabbed him, he ate, and he offered himself to be touched. <coughs> Excuse me. We read the 1 Corinthians passage, and that is an important passage of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. You can take that little part and date it back to within three years of the events. And if you that's important if you look at my lecture from last week. But 500 people saw him at one time. Psychologically, we know it's true that 500 people do not have the same hallucination. And you have, with the appearances of Jesus... You have different people at different times under different conditions, all having the same uh, experience that this man who died is now alive. 
And finally, the tomb was empty. If it was a spiritual resurrection, again, why did the enemies of Jesus produce the body of Jesus when the disciples began to preach the resurrection? So I don't think the spirit hallucination theory explains our three facts. I think what explains our three facts is this. Jesus rose from the dead. It explains the empty tomb. It explains his appearances. And it explains the disciples going from being a group of cowards to 50 days later courageously preaching to the very group of people that voted to execute Jesus. I think the only thing that explains that is that there was a man, Jesus of Nazareth, who was nailed to two pieces of timber, died, was buried, and three days later God rose him from the dead in the same body that died on the cross, came back to life. This is important. So just obviously, as we've said, what does it mean? Well, it means that death has been conquered. It means that those who put their trust in Jesus will also conquer death. And it guarantees us power to live our lives now. The resurrection of Jesus is a fact. Yes, a fact you and I have to deal with. And so I close with this statement. As I've been studying apologetics and dealing with these kind of subjects for well over 20 years now, I used to have a lot of questions. And I was trying to un Ravel all the questions out there, just and it was always at times overwhelming to me. And finally, a few years ago, I came to the place where I said, I'm going to lay all of my remaining questions at the entrance of an empty tomb. Because I was so thoroughly convinced by the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead that every other question I have pales in comparison because I know he is alive. And so, at the end of this, if it's true Jesus said he would die and rise again, and did it, then what he says is very important. And he says eternal life is only found in him. So the question is, do you know him? And he says those who know him should live for him. So do you live for him? If he is alive, and I think we've shown that that's the best explanation for these facts, there's no solid reason to doubt that it's the case that he's alive, then you and I are responsible to him. This quote from Simon Greeley, he was a lawyer in the 1700s. He says, the foundation of our religion is a basis of fact. The fact of the birth, ministry, miracles, death, resurrection by the evangelists as having actually occurred within their own personal knowledge. Well, I hope this series has been encouraging to you. And again, we're going to put this on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions about what we shared here tonight or any of our series on Apologetics 101, reach out to us here at the church or on our Facebook page. Again, we're going to have some information in the vestibule for you. And uh, again, we're here for you. If we can do anything for you, please let us know. God bless.